Hello and welcome to Embedded. I'm Elysia White here with Christopher White. Our guest this week is Dr. Lucy Rogers. We're going to talk about robots and dinosaurs and makers. And I'm just hoping all of those things all together. Hello, Lucy. Thanks for joining us today. It's great fun to be here. Could you tell us about yourself? I'm a maker. I solve problems by inventing and making stuff. For example, as we've already alluded to, I put electronics in robot dinosaurs, uh, but I've also made a wine bottle that lights up when you send a text message to it. So you never have to drink alone. Uh, You could always have (laughs) your friends texting you to say they're having a drink at the same time. Um, I've made eight-inch tall mannequins for a dressmaker for her marketing campaign. So I I make all sorts of things. And you also were a judge on some television show? I was a judge (laughs) on BBC Robot Wars, where robots pitted against each other in an arena in a fight to the death. I just want to bring that up because we're doing lightning round next and it won't make sense. Uh, So with lightning round, we ask you short questions. We want short answers. And if we're behaving ourselves, we won't ask you for all the details until later (laughs) in the show. Okay. All right. An easy one. A tip everyone should know. Don't try to catch a falling soldering iron. Okay. That's a good one. Yeah. I've been, I've been known to, (laughs) I usually catch it on my leg. (laughs) Should we bring back the dinosaurs? Always. Favorite getting started board? Raspberry Pi. Robot you'd least like to meet in a dark alley? Hmm. K9 always gave me a bit of the creeps. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Doctor Who K9. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Robot you'd most like to have a beer with? Oh, so kill a lot every time. A kill a lot. Okay, we're going to have to look that up. Uh, <laughs> That's a, a, one of the Robot Wars house robots. Okay. How long until we have autonomous robot wars on television? Ah, that's an interesting one. Ugh. Ten years. Wow, that's pessimistic. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, Can you be pessimistic about war? <laughs> <laughs> What's a day? The question should really be: When do we have robots judging human wars? That's more scary. That is terrifying. Actually, <laughs> yes, that really is. <laughs> What's a day in your life like these days? Varied. It always involves Twitter. It, if, I, if it's a good day, it involves making something. And it always involves a dog walk. When you say making, that means many different things to different people. From electronics to software to knitting. And I mean, just everything can be making. What does it mean to you? To me, it's using creativity and imagination to make something physical. And I know that making does cover all those other things. Photography, art, computer games is all making. But to me, it's to make something physical, usually with my hands. And so how does this come in to match with the electronics and software side? I mean... I I sometimes play with clay, that's making, and yet when we talk about making with the capital M, it usually does involve some form of science, technology. It often does, but it doesn't have to. I I have a city and guilds qualification in wood turning, and I don't do, I don't touch the electronics in the lathe, I just make things with a chisel and a lump of wood. So I haven't got the electronics making in that part, but sometimes I put the two things together. Um, recently, I had to make the end fall off a concertina for a musician in a comedy band. He <laughs> wanted to be playing and then the end fall off the concertina. So I started uh, using solenoids for that and a button. Um, and so when he pressed the button, the solenoids would unlatch and the end would fall off. And it actually transpired that that wasn't a, a really good solution. There wasn't enough friction involved. And so I ended up with magnets and kitchen cupboard um, locks. So it, it 
that problem didn't need an electronic solution. Did you, at any point in thinking about this problem, consider explosives? <laughs> yes, but he said he wanted to be in the background rather than uh, the foreground. I wanted to put smoke in and all sorts, but uh, he wasn't having any of that. You you started this uh, Guild of Makers. W- what is yep. that? The Guild of Makers is for people who who make and may have done it for a hobby, but now want to do it as a profession. So I think that many, many people have been making for a hobby and are starting to sell their stuff, are starting to make products, are starting to want to give up their day jobs and make for a living. But there wasn't really anywhere to go to talk to other people who were also doing this. And this is both craft side and the more technical electronics side. So I know wood carvers who they can belong to the, the guild of, of wood carvers, but that is just for wood carving. If they wanted to talk to someone who's doing something maybe slightly electrical, um, even a knitter, they, they would have to cross boundaries, cross um, disciplines, whereas the Guild of Makers is for any discipline. And it's helping, helping become professional. It's helping the maker industry and those who are or want to become makers in the maker industry. The UK has always had a rich tradition of artisan industries. I I understand why we have more of a a maker community in the United States, because it's a hobby. And so there's this idea of going from hobby to professionals is odd. But I I mean, maybe it's just my, my bias, uh, but, you know, I think about the, well, Wedgwood was one of those, uh, it's a ceramics place that Christopher's looking at me like I'm crazy. Uh, <laughs> and, and they have beautiful art and it was, it went, well, I should stop explaining and just go with, I feel like you ha- already have a rich uh, history of this. So I'm surprised. I'm happy, but I'm surprised. We do have a rich history. But that's mainly it. It's history. Our manufacturing died and has been was on the decline for many years as um, the UK as a whole took up more service industries rather than actually manufacturing and making. So the all the potteries, a lot of the potteries closed down. Um, so we don't have as many as we used to. We don't have as many craftspeople as we used to. And the education system, if you were... Um, if you were good at doing exams, you were pushed down the academic route. And if you were good with your hands, you were pushed down the more practical route. And there wasn't any crossover. It all seems to be a, um, the practical route wasn't as good. I know that to become a master craftsman takes many more hours and dedication than to get a PhD. But it wasn't seen as the same, um, same type of career path. And so, I mean, I think it's all coming back that we can be creative. Well, factories don't want people to really be creative. They want you to make a product the same every time. And that's what managers are there to do, is to make sure that you you stick to the rules, you do it the same way every time, and at the end, you get the same product out at the end. Whereas if you can use your creativity, you'll get something bespoke out at the end, which a lot of people want. Maybe not in, maybe not in your car. I think that's that's... That is changing as things get more mass produced and uh, automation, you know, moves factory jobs from being people to being people supervising robots. Uh, but yeah, I think people are looking, at least there is a, there is a market for people looking for things that are handcrafted and, and made with different kind of attention. So, yeah, I, I've written a book and I belong to the Society of Authors, which has been going since the 1800s. And the Society of Authors will offer me a load of benefits, such as I can network with other writers. I can go to the the children's authors um, group and talk with other children's authors. I could ask questions about um, 
my my accounts and how to set up the company. I can ask them questions about my contracts. So all these things that Society of Authors has already got, I wanted for makers because I didn't know, should I become a sole trader or a limited company or a PLC and what's all the difference? How do I go from here? How do I get insurance? How do I sell these things? How do I get my items on the Amazon marketplace, for example? There was nowhere I found easily that I could go for these kind of things. That makes a lot of sense, especially as you were talking about the different tracks in your education system, that if you do the practical track, you may not learn about computer marketing, and that may be what you need in order to sell. So how are you going to teach these things? Well, we're really just at the beginning of this journey of the Guild of Makers. Uh, We had our launch just a week ago, and it's all very exciting, but we're still finding our way. But we are getting uh, partnered with legal firms so they can give us um, information on what we're doing on on how to set up a company, which is the best type of company for which type of business. Um, We're partnering with um, business people who can give us information on how to price our things, how to cost our items. So we're we're partnering with a lot of organizations. Um, IBM have partnered with us to give us training on how to use their software, which we can then um, actually start investigating data. So if if you've got some kind of project or something that wants to use a lot of data or interrogates a lot of data, you can go on the the IBM courses. We've partnered with Autodesk, who do um, computer-aided design software, and they can help. They're helping to train us on on using various uh, CAD packages, and so we can then design things for three D printing. So we're partnering with a lot of, of companies who are really keen to get makers involved. And how about the makers? How are you finding them? It all started about last June, June 2017. And I was discussing with a friend about, I wanted to go to a maker fair. And in the UK, most of the maker fairs are aimed at under 18s. Um, You have or zero to maker. So you can't solder here. Now, by the end of this hour session, you've soldered a couple of LEDs and a resistor in. I wanted to either move the kids out of the way and have a go myself, which apparently isn't that politically correct to do. <laughs> uh, and I wanted to talk to the people running them, run, running these courses and running the things saying, oh, what do you do? Oh, you make that. That's really exciting. But there wasn't something for the grown-ups. It was mainly aimed at either beginner, beginners or children. And so I thought, well, you know, I wonder if it's just me that wants this group this this professional institution of of grown-up makers who are doing it professionally so i started makers hour on twitter 8 p.m to 9 p.m uk time hashtag makers hour and a host will pose five or six questions during the hour and people would just respond and we've done 41, 42 makers hours uh, since last June. We've had 25 different hosts from all around the world, four or five different countries. We've had humanitarian makers join in. Uh, We've had leather workers. We've had the electronics um, side, all asking different questions. But it's not just the host that holds it together. It's there's there's People then start talking to each other. And I've seen on Twitter, someone will post, how do I do this? And then someone who they met on Maker's Hour will respond. And so just building this community. So when we actually met, uh, there was uh, 50 or 60 of us at the launch. And we'd all been tweeting on Maker's Hour. And so we all met for the first time, which was absolutely amazing. Oh, you're the person who makes that. Oh, how do you do that? And it it was just great. Do you think being able to meet people in person is an important part of it? For me, it is. It's it's difficult when you don't really know other people in your village, in your town, who do the same sort of thing as you. So, oh, you make with electronics. Okay, um, how does that work? But when you find other like-minded people, and they've other 
they don't have to be with the electronics. It could be um, someone who's passionate about knitting, who's passionate about sewing, who's who's passionate about their woodcraft. That passion comes through and the respect that you get for one another for just because they, you make something and you spend the time to actually put your your physical work in and often your soul into these things. Uh, talking on Twitter and talking uh, electronically is good and it's a great start. But I find you have the conversations of yes and when you're with somebody. So for example, I um, was using a laser cutter to um, I, I was making a wooden spoon for a booby prize for a pub quiz. And someone said, yes, and you could laser cut on that wooden spoon um, the booby prize. But on the back, you could put you know, a smiley face or an unhappy face. Or a, there was there was always taking it one step further. Whereas on my own, I would probably say ah, that'll do. If someone else is there, they can say, yes, and why don't you as well? Uh, which is always to me inspiring. Or you just look at someone and say, "Ah, oh, right." So I, I went to a talk and someone had made a asteroids game using it was Sebley um, He he he's made a gun that shoots a laser at a projected asteroid screen, and out of this gun is comes smoke, and that smoke came from an e-cigarette. And I wanted that smoke system for some firecrackers that I was making, some indoor firecrackers. And so I was talking to him, saying, how did you make the smoke? How did you do that? How do you make something that can smoke inside without setting all the fire alarms off? And so we got chatting and uh, I used that idea. So by seeing other people and seeing what they do, you can have the conversations. So sometimes it's hard to actually start chatting to people in real life. But yeah, it works. When I think of guilds, I, I think of formal apprenticeship and things like that and moving from, you know, novice to journeyman to master. And I know that's not what you're talking about with this, but do you have some ways of connecting people? So, oh, I, this person wants to be a mentor and we have these people who want to be mentored. Uh, is there kind of a more formal uh, rendezvous process there's not a formal process yet, but we've had quite a few people say, I know someone who's looking for an apprentice. I know someone who's looking for work experience. And we put that out to the community and people have come back and said, yes, OK, I can take I can take one student in this area for this long. Um, yes, we're looking for an apprentice. We can do that. So one of the things I'd, I'd really like to take forward is the apprenticeship scheme. But we're also looking at in the future of having an, an accredited membership scheme. So at the moment, anybody can join. And it doesn't matter what your skill level, whether you're a beginner, whether you're advanced, whether you've been doing this professionally for 100 years or, or for five minutes. It doesn't matter. You can join as a member if you think the benefits of joining suit you. And it doesn't matter where in the world you are either. You can still join. In the future, we're going to have accredited membership where your item is peer reviewed or what you make is peer reviewed. And so not only will you make a good quality product um, to on, on time and to budget and it's it will um, be fit for purpose. So we will have people looking at all, all these things and you, you'll uh, charge it so that you can have a sustainable income so you're not just charging for materials you're actually including your time in that and once you've got that we're going to say you're an accredited maker and you can use the guild of makers stamp so anyone looking for oh i need someone to put something on the end of my conveyor belt or i need someone to design a um, shop window front with all singing all dancing puppets in it something like this they can come to the guild <laughs> and say sorry we, we have one of those nearby it's nearby so. that we go visit often <laughs> um that you can come to the guild and we'll be able to either put you in touch with these people or you can just see that it's um they've already got the accredited guild of makers stamp this will help uh, a lot of individuals and sole traders who maybe can't get the word out themselves before we go on with this i do want to ask you a little bit about some of the background, because it is important to see how we got here. And I am going to lead up to the question of how do you have time to run this organization and do your own making? But to start that, 
to start this whole process of how we get to that question. Um, you've done the BBC Robot Wars. You've written a book. Uh, what what was the title of the book? It was for kids, right? Uh, it it wasn't actually aimed at kids. It was aimed at um, it, it was it was aimed at me because <laughs> I was I was working in the space industry and I knew a lot about the small bit that I was working on, but I didn't know how it all worked together from the launch system to where the the satellite was going to go. Um, how you you put the rocket motor in, which fuels you use. So I didn't know the, the big picture, and so I asked, "Where's where's the big picture book?" And uh, I was pointed in the direction of children's books, which was mainly how do you have a Wii in space, um, which was interesting, but n- not really the bits that I needed to know. Or I was given really big tomes with a load of maths in it. So maths I can do, but it's hard work. And I just wanted a plain English version of um, of rocket science. So the book's called It's Only Rocket Science, An Introduction in Plain English. And it takes you through the whole process of what is required to build a rocket um, without any maths and without any formulae. Was this before or after you started looking at the problem of space debris? That came, the book came before. And in the research for the book, I realized that there was a problem of space debris. And you have a PhD. I have a PhD in bubbles. <laughs> okay, maybe. maybe. <laughs> Going to need some more explanation. Yeah. On that. <laughs> what kind of bubbles? Um, I have a PhD in making bubbles. I, it's. Um, I think technically we call it fluid dynamics. Ah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that makes it sound I, harder. <laughs> uh, but bubbles is definitely more fun. I looked at a piece of equipment that um, makes firefighting foam. So if there's a petrochemical fire, you can't put water on it because the oil will come to the top. And so you have to smother it in foam. And depending on what type of fire it is, how far away you are, will depend on what size bubble you want to put on this fire. And I was looking at the piece of equipment that made bubbles, Nobody knew how they made bubbles. They just knew that it worked. So I made the whole system out of Perspex so I could see through it. I got a high-speed video camera, which back in those days was a VHS recording. Um, The whole system took up the back of an estate car. Nowadays, you can get it for the size of a laptop, but um, it was 40,000 frames per second, and I watched bubbles being formed. You, you you say you have a PhD in bubbles, and yet clearly this is deeply technical, and many of the things you've worked on have been deeply, deeply technical, and yet you do make it approachable. Do you have any strategies to help other people do that? No, I just put it in the language I understand it. <laughs> Fair enough. How did you get from bubbles to space debris to writing a book and and judging robot wars for BBC. Is there a path? Not an obvious one. (laughs) Not an (laughs) obvious path at all. When I was still at school, I was 17, 18. uh, We had a club at school that was called the Great Egg Race after a TV program in the 80s in the UK. And the TV program was get an egg as far um, away as possible, transport the egg as far as possible using just the power from a rubber band was the premise of the book of the the show and then it went on to can you fly an egg and can you move an egg around so we had this club at school that did something similar and i remember we had to set party poppers off at the opposite end of the or far away as possible without touching them and so I'd set myself up at the other end of the room and I used, we were in the physics lab. So I used a ticker tape trolley. It's a little trolley with three wheels. And I put it down a ramp and uh, off it went down the other side of the room and it knocked the the bench over that I'd been holding my party popper off on. The bench fell. The party popper went off right under the nose of my teacher who was marking, <laughs> um, who looked up looked around, looked at me and said, I think you might like to do engineering as a career, Lucy. (laughs) So I went into engineering, but it took me um, 20, 30 years, 20 years to actually go from there to 
finding the career that actually does that kind of fun engineering. I was sponsored by Rolls-Royce Industrial Power Systems. So I was working on um, substations, electricity substations for a few years. And then I was working in industry at the um, company that made firefighting equipment where I did the PhD in industry. So yeah, I, I did some proper jobs and then I set up a computer consultancy, which paid really well, but I it was boring as anything. Um, one day when I was meant to be doing a VAT return, so doing my, my accounts for the year, I got an email saying, would you like to become a scientist in residence at the Guardian newspaper? So I thought, well, yes, <laughs> that sounds fun. Um, the whole idea was for the British Association for the Advancement of Science, as they were at the time. And they wanted to get scientists and engineers into the media uh, so that the media could learn about scientists and scientists could learn about the media. And so we wouldn't have this disconnect of boffins say and <laughs> all the scientists saying, why, why are they saying that about us? And all the media saying, well, what, what are they talking about? So I did a, a three week stint at the Guardian newspaper uh, in the UK, in London, uh, and discovered that I could put stuff into plain English. And had a wonderful time there. Uh, Tim Radford was my mentor for for the three weeks. And so it just really took off from there. But also when I was doing uh, my qualification in wood turning, which I did as an, as an evening class because the PhD was getting a bit too much. So I thought I'd uh, carry on with some practical things in the evening. And I was uh, told to write up as if I was writing um, a how-to guide. So uh, we've got books called ha uh, Haynes Manuals uh, for Cars, which show you a picture and then some words like take the wheel off by unscrewing the nuts and then lift the wheel off. And, and then it shows you how how to do this in pictures, words and pictures. And so I started the writing up my um, my, my qualification in, in wood turning of, okay, this is how I turned a bowl and this is how I turned the legs on a stool and this is how which gave me something I could go back to and refer to. So once I'd done that and realised that not only can I turn stuff into plain English, but I can also turn practical things that I'm making into a, a recipe, if you like, of how to do it, I could then go back to that recipe and say, oh, how did I? Oh, yeah, I did something like that. And I can't quite remember how I did it. And this was back in the days when the internet was still quite new. And there wasn't the YouTube to just go and have a look at. And so that's how I started writing how to's recipes um, on how I did things. Uh, I remember writing once just for my own personal blog, how to make a snowman. <laughs> um, and it was it was it was absolutely full of uh, photographs of and you get the snow like this and the dog is here for scale and then wrap a scarf around it and put a hat and you need a carrot and some coal for the buttons and so all this thing um and so because i was writing these for my own fun people picked it up and started asking could i write for their blog sites could i write for their web pages uh, could i write for their magazines and so i did and i often have, oh, I've got this project that I really want to do, but I can't justify spending the time to do it. But this company wants to pay me to write a blog on a make thing that of, of my choice. So I will then make the thing, write it up and kill two birds with one stone, which has been great fun. Do you introduce yourself as a writer or an engineer? Is there a single word that is the default? maker all right yeah. In interestingly though it's only since i started thinking about the guild of makers that i have realized that i am a maker uh, i am a maker first and an engineer second i always used to describe myself as an engineer because that's the qualifications that i did i did a mechanical engineering degree my phds um in fluid dynamics again mechanical engineering i'm a fellow of the institute of mechanical engineers so all, all the qualifications all the paperwork i've got is in engineering but if i actually look at it every project that i've done and everything i've done throughout my life i've always been a maker i have got things i made when i was six years old um still around my house i have got you know, pottery that i made i have got some um, embroidered uh, an embroidered rug that i made I was always making, my family were always making. And because it was such an ingrained part of who I am, I hadn't 
separated it into actually that is who I am. I am a maker um, until recently. And I thought, actually, my degree, my PhD was in making bubbles. It wasn't in the maths. It was how how are bubbles made? Um, so I've, I've all my um, previous work at Rolls Royce. I was in the manufacturing department. I was how do we make the bits that go into a substation? I, I've always loved to make. You also have been well. You've been on television, and you are a writer, and you are a speaker. And yet, you said in a tweet recently that you're an introvert. How do you balance that? What I mean by introvert, in being an introvert, is that people being around people tires me out. I enjoy it, but I get exhausted by it. I don't gain um, energy from being with people. I gain inspiration, I gain ideas, and I gain friendship. But it really is hard for me um, to do it constantly and to make the small talk. Uh, I find I find uncomfortable. However, I find that if I have something in common with someone, so I used to go to conferences and find out who else was tweeting at that conference, arrange to meet whoever that person was by the coffee bar and say, oh, hello, I'm on Twitter too. And we'd have a common interest. We'd have a common thing. Not only were we at this conference together, but we also tweeted. And so it started from there and, and I found a, a seed to to start a conversation with. And for me, that was much easier. And so for Maker's Hour, um, when we had our launch, there must have been 95% of the people had chatted with someone at Maker's Hour already. And so we sort of knew each other. And so it just made life so much easier. But I also know that if I'm doing something like a conference, the next day or the next week, I really need a quiet week of not being with people. Yes. It's, I, I always need to schedule the downtime. And it is easier to talk to people you kind of know, even if they're Twitter friends. I have found that small talk, agreeing about the weather, is sort of like finding somebody in Twitter. It, it, it allows you to start agreeing about something else and to go into a deeper conversation. It just, it, it's that ramp. Uh, small talk can be, but like you, I find it kind of tedious. <laughs> okay, so now back to my big question. You, you're a maker. You want to build things. You want to communicate how to build these things. You want to, to actually put your hands on the material and, and form something physically. The Guild of Makers is just an idea. How are you, how are you balancing this a uh, relatively big project with communication and websites and and marketing and all of the things you can't touch with your own personal desire to be a maker. It feels like an administrator and a maker are two different things. I am getting together a team to do a lot of the bits that I can't or I don't do very well um, and they do very well. So now that we've started and we've got established and we've got some sponsors and uh, some sponsorship money coming in, some membership money coming in, I can now start to build that team and pay people to do the things that the guild needs and I can carry on doing my making. So I don't want to – the Guild of Makers for me is not how I'm going to make a living. Uh, the Guild of Makers is something I want to be there. So it's got to be able to wash its own face. It's got to be able to do its own thing. And I'm more than happy to shout for it, to be a spokesperson for the Guild, um, to run the Guild. But all the, um, all, just to me, all the hard work of actually doing the administration will be outsourced. Yeah. Well, that makes a lot more sense. What are you making these days? I've just finished making a steampunk advertising sign that I can control all the lights. So it's like a makeup mirror in uh, a dressing room. So it's got a, a big mirror, all the lights. Um, I've got 24 volt incandescent lights, so the old style light bulbs all the way around and my company logo in the middle. So you can see through the mirror, but I've uh, laser cut my company logo so you can see through to the mirror and I can control each of those light bulbs individually and so I can have them chase around or flash um, 
and and looks really cool. I'm pleased with it. What are you using to do the control? That's a Raspberry Pi in there. And the the power because the those those bulbs are um, you're going to have to have some more power than just Raspberry Pi GPIO. Yeah, it's got a separate power supply, but they're 24 volts, so they're not um, alternating currents. So they're not normal light bulbs that we just put in the in the house. They're uh, ones that are used on uh, boats and caravans and things. Um, and I've had to put in some extra electronics for the Raspberry Pi to switch a open collector driver, which is a bit like a relay. So it's the Raspberry Pi switches the relay, which switches the lights on and off. And what are you programming in? Node-RED. I always program in Node-RED. It's a visual flow programming language, so it's all drag and drop. And I just have to drag and drop so I can say, ah, when this signal input comes in, do turn on GPO, um, GPIO pin three, pin four, pin five, you know, do do these things, add a time delay, switch it off again. Um, I'll put, uh, use it, and so you can dim it, PWM. So you can say, okay, only put it on at 50% brightness. And all those things are available in Node-RED as drag and drop. And if the node isn't there already, you can write a function node in JavaScript, or I can ask my friends to write function node for me in JavaScript because my programming skills are still a bit on the dodgy side. And uh, it all works beautifully. Okay, what else are you building? Um, or, or what was your favorite thing to have built in the last three years? I really enjoyed doing the light up wine bottle, uh, which I mentioned earlier. And I've got some boots that have LEDs in. And I hacked them so that I could now tweet them to change color. <laughs> So if anybody tweets my boots, they change to that color. Are these Wi-Fi or cell modem? They are Wi-Fi. So they connect to my phone as a hotspot. Uh, and and that is Node-RED. What are you using for the uh, board on those? Because that can't be the Pi. That's too big. No, that's a Wemos ESP8266. Ah, uh, yes. Is in there. Um, so I've got a small Arduino um, code on on the Wemos, but that's actually talking back to the um, IBM cloud, which has got a Raspberry Pi, uh, not a Raspberry Pi, sorry, uh, it's got a Node-RED flow in the cloud. So I programmed it in the cloud, and all that's on the Wemos is says get the information from the cloud. That makes sense. These are different projects they're smaller than some of the things you've done in the past do you miss the big large working with a huge team things or do you really prefer being able to do it all yourself interesting question i i like both so i'm still working with uh, the theme park on the isle of wight in the uk with the robot dinosaurs um They've built up their team a lot, lot larger in the few last few years, but I'm still go down there and we discuss, oh, we could get the dinosaurs to do this and we can get them to do that. And how do we do that? And I, I trained them on Node-RED so they can program them themselves now, which is great fun. But so I get that feedback and that buzz of working together. Um, but I, I have a very short attention span, so I like the short projects. And how important is it to write up these projects? Oh, for me, it's very important because I usually, a lot of my stuff is open source because I have asked a lot of people for help. So I mentioned that on the function nodes on Node-RED, I've got a friend who will often write the JavaScript for me. Um, when I come to use a, a flow for switching the uh, light bulbs on, on the on the steampunk advertising sign, I was using information straight off the web, uh, mainly from Adafruit probably on that. Um, and I was using the Adafruit board in the light up wine bottle. And I was just using their how-tos on that. So once I've put it all together, I write it up as my how-to, 
crediting these others so that when I say, oh, how did I do that? I don't have to go back to five or six different people and say, you know, we did that thing and you wrote me a bit of code. What did it look like and how did we do it? We can go back and have a look at the blog post and say, that's exactly how I did it. And I can take that little part out of there and use it. And now my friends who have who helped me, they come back to me and said, you know, I helped you on that thing. Which project was it? Because I now need to do that again. And I know you wrote it up nicely. I like that idea of using blogs as an open lab notebook in a way. It's not just, yeah. just to, it's not just to share with the world. It's also to remember yourself and to have a reference that you've created. I mean, that's that, that in itself is an act of creation, you know, apart from the other stuff. And I also find that if I don't understand it well enough to write it, I don't understand it. I was talking about the Hacky Day prize yesterday and I kept going back to the idea that one of the main judging criteria is how reproducible is it. And we finally got to the point that the people we were talking to understood it wasn't just whether or not I could build it, because the chances are relatively small that I'm going to try to build it. It's that the making it reproducible means that you've made me understand it enough. And that that's the writing part of it is making sure that not only can I build it someday, but that you can rebuild it someday and that we both understand it all the way down. Yeah. I I write two different styles of blogs. One is a real step-by-step hand-holding, how do you do this? And some of it, if I haven't got time or I've made something else um, that I I don't need the step-by-step guide to, I'll say, I found this on the internet here and I found this on the internet here and I... For example, I used a cable of sufficient thickness. So I I didn't say how I'd calculated the cable thickness. Um, I hadn't put all those calculations in. I just said it was of sufficient thickness and putting the responsibility onto the person who's making it because they won't be making it exactly the same. They'll be doing their own thing somewhere along the line. Yeah, their hardware store will have a different cable anyway. Yeah. Uh, So robot dinosaurs. What? (laughs) <laughs> I, I waited as long as I could. I'm sorry. It's just, <laughs> tell me about the robot dinosaurs. Do they roar? First, do they roar? Yes, they roar. And and do you have a triceratops? Yes, we have a triceratops. Can I borrow him? <laughs> no. Can I ride him? <laughs> <laughs> have you seen the video of me riding one? No, I haven't. I'll have to look for that. <laughs> no, can you tell us more about them? Thanks. I um, had a phone call from the owner of a theme park who said, my dinosaurs are broken. Can you come and hack them? Um, so I did. I that brought a team together. All my life I've <laughs> wished for that phone call. Ah, uh, well, <laughs> right place, right time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, what, what can I say? <laughs> I have I had a reputation Um, On the Isle of Wight, I used to live on the Isle of Wight. I had a reputation of doing technical things. And these robot dinosaurs had come in. There had been a problem with the main T-Rex. So they'd been installed at Easter. And just before the summer, which was the biggest, uh, uh, 80% of the visitors come during the the summer six. So just before summer, one of the dinosaurs, the big T-Rex, had broken. And... I wasn't available at the time. So their tech guy locked himself in a room with a Raspberry Pi and book on on how to program it. And he managed to get this dinosaur working again and it limped through the summer. But after the summer, when they had more time on their hands, I brought together a team um, including uh, electrical engineers, electronic engineers, um, electricians and also computer programmers, and we had a look at what was inside these boxes and changed it so that anyone at the park or any of the staff at the park could actually say, ah, that needs a new one of those. Let's get a Raspberry Pi. We can just go to the local shop, get another Raspberry Pi. They're £35 or whatever, um, and we don't have to ship the electronics back from China, which will take six weeks. And so there are Raspberry Pis. Is it really the software that's Breaking, or I, I would think that it would be more the mechanical parts. No, it, the mechanical parts, they can fix themselves because they've got welders um, or, and 
yeah, the the motors were okay. They were mainly a uh, they were mainly truck windscreen wiper motors. Um, <laughs> a lot of these um, or truck motors. So there was cams going on, but the, it was the the controller. It was mainly the electronics controllers that were going wrong. Um, either water was getting into the system um, or, or just something was was fusing. And so some, some of the electronics had to come out, some other um, power supplies had to go in. Um, and we used Raspberry Pis, one, because the staff could program them using Node-RED. So we, we taught all the staff how to program them themselves. So instead of just going on the pre-programmed, every dinosaur w- wags its tail, breathes, roars, um, and sometimes the roar wasn't in time with the mouth opening, uh, which was <laughs> a little disconcerting. Um, and so they could reprogram all the dinosaurs themselves. Um, and so the the actual the brain, the control system was a Raspberry Pi. And then we needed a, another electronics board, which um, someone else on the team designed and made for the park to actually control the big motors. Okay, it, listeners, if any of you need your robots hacked, feel free to call me. Uh, but Lucy, what is the next phone call you wish you could get? I mean, what what would be the thing that someone calls and say, we want you to do this? And you're just like, oh yeah, let me drop everything. I'll be right there. I mentioned that there was a program called The Great Egg Race on in the 80s, and it was fronted by a, a wonderful man called Professor Heinz Wolf, who sadly recently passed away. But I would love to bring back that program. I would love to front that program, bring back The Great Egg Race, uh, do all those things that inspired me when I was a teenager uh, to, well, what, want to inspire the next generation, but actually just to have an awful lot of fun making silly things that inspire people do you uh, we're going to go back to making in general but uh do you see any difference between the communities in europe the uk in the united states or otherwise internationally or are people who interested in hacking and making basically cut from the same cloth i was speaking recently with someone who said that the Makers in the USA and the make affairs in the USA are a completely different thing than the make affairs in the UK. Um, and I haven't been to enough in the USA, but I've met makers in China and in Vietnam and in Germany, and we all speak the same language. Uh, it doesn't matter if we don't actually speak the same language. We all speak geek and tech and making, and we all have that passion for let us make something that works and is fun or does something. Let us do something, actually produce something. And so, yeah, at heart, all the makers are the same. The how we go about it is probably slightly different and how we make money out of it is mm. slightly different. Uh, but that's more research required on that front. Yeah, one of the things that I wonder if I wonder how Kickstarter plays in the UK versus the United States, because the path to making products often goes that route here and can lead to great triumphs and also great failures when <laughs> even when failures of success when uh, something is so popular that the person can't handle you know, make making enough and keep up with it. Um, so it'd be interesting to to find out if the paths are slightly different in different places. I, I know makers here in the UK use Kickstarter, and some have used it very successfully, and some have sworn never to use it again. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, well, I had one more question about your book. Also, um, it came out in two thousand eight. Yep. So, space flight has has taken a quick turn since then <laughs> yeah well the shuttle the shuttle was still flying when it shuttle came out. was still flying and then we had a number of years of doldrums and now there's all these companies spacex uh electron um doing blue something blue well uh, jeff bezos's uh spacex likes co- like company that hasn't hasn't quite advanced as far as SpaceX has yet, but why are you laughing? Editorializing much? No, I'm trying not to editorialize. I actually, I think they're all great. 
Um, my, my question is, do you feel like revisiting that topic and, and revising the book or, or in light of this kind of explosion? Well, that's a bad word. This uh, <laughs> expansion and democratization of spaceflight. <laughs> I still love spaceflight. Um, I found that uh, when I was working in space debris, I couldn't do it as a one-person company. I really had to be part of a much, much larger team, and I'm talking you know, hundreds probably rather than tens of, of people, and that's not me. I definitely want to work in much smaller groups and for shorter periods of time. I didn't want to just focus on space debris for the next 10 years. Um, I do have a, a butterfly-like mind, mm -hmm. and, oh, shiny, I want to go over there now and do that thing. So although the space industry was fun, the book for me was – I didn't understand how it all worked and I wanted to write the book to understand how it all worked. So for me, it was that that's now done. Yeah. And things are different, but not that different. The laws of physics don't change. We hope. <laughs> Often. <laughs> so far. <laughs> you have, we've kind of covered this idea of, of small teams versus big and being an introvert, and going out and finding friendships. And to me, there is always this problem that I want to know more people. I, I do feel that relationships are important to mental health and happiness. But on the other hand, I, I don't really like people. So, <laughs> <laughs> so there's this big interplay between them. Do you have any advice for figuring out how to get over the hurdle of being in teams and being out there and finding your people? For me, it's been really interesting to find people on Maker's Hour who are my kind of people. And I didn't realize, I, I couldn't specify who are my kind of people, but it seems to be those with a passion for something. And it doesn't actually have to be making. I had assumed that my kind of people would be makers, uh, crafters of some description, probably into science. But um, I've made great friends with the musician whose concertina end wanted to fall off. And he's definitely not into science and I'm not, not into music. So it's been really interesting to see how that works on, okay, he's passionate about that. I'm passionate about this, but actually we still get on. And so to me, a lot of it has been about going into areas where I'm not expecting to find anyone who I will get on with. Um, for example, the dressmaker. Um, I wasn't expecting to become friends with someone who made dresses. Uh, fashion and clothes is not something I'm interested in. And yet here's someone who is passionate about what they do and loves it. And so we can have that respect for each other and respect for what they do without actually having the in deep interest in the subject itself to me it's all about learning and learning new things and so the more i can learn the better and the more people i can bounce off with varied ideas is great i love taking an idea from one discipline and putting it into another area and so that's often how i i make my friends I'm talking to so many people um, via via Twitter, via WhatsApp, and we build these relationships before we really meet in real life. And so we've got a relationship to start with. And so the next step of, oh, this is real life, let's have a coffee, is is so much easier. I do find that the people I like tend to be people who like things. I don't necessarily want to have coffee with somebody who hates everything. It's just no fun. And I don't, I don't really care whether they like knitting or electronics. I just want them to like it. The enthusiasm is the key to me. It sounds like you're in a similar boat. Is, is that right? Yeah. If I Tar a lot of people with the same brush of uh, spirally ups who are the yes and we could do this and then you could do that and oh isn't this great 
the uh, spirally round and round who just talk about the weather and the spirally downs who say, isn't everything awful and depressing? And I just want to spend more times, more time with the spirally up people in the world. Spirally up. I like that. Spirally up. I may be using that again in the future. <laughs> Uh, well, before we let you go, I want to ask you just a couple more questions about the Guild of Makers. Uh, what would I need to do to become a member? Become a member? Go to guildofmakers.org, click on the become a member and fill in the details. That's all you need to do. You don't have to be um, a professional maker. You don't have to be selling your stuff. You could be an amateur. If the benefits of joining the Guild are for you, go there and join. If you want to find out more about the benefits and we have discounts from companies, we have advice from, as I mentioned, legal firms and other places, we have training courses, we have meetups so far um, only in the UK, but we're taking international members and we're looking at setting up some kind of uh, licensing franchise chapters, something in countries around the world, uh, because we've got interest from many countries who, who want to be part of this. Uh, so anyone can join um, over 18s only because of various legal things of taking names and addresses. Uh, but you can join and the benefits for me, the biggest benefit has been meeting virtually um, either on Slack or on Twitter, via uh, email or in real life, other makers and suppliers who have the same mindset. And that has been a huge thing for me. And there's a bit of a fee. It's 59 UK pounds for the year. If you join before the 4th of April, you will get not only till the 4th of April 2019, but you will also be given founder membership with all the benefits that that entails when I've worked out what those benefits are. <laughs> are you familiar with Boldport? Yes, he's a great guy. I wonder. I wonder if there's some uh, overlap with that. Do you do you foresee working more with other people in the UK, uh, cross promoting? Always happy to do as much promoting as as possible for any kind of maker. I I don't feel like I'm in competition uh, with any of the other clubs, um, any of the maker fairs. This is, we're specifically for professional makers, but anyone, as I say, anyone can join. And you don't actually have to be a, make something that's physical. You, you could be a photographer, a computer game maker. You can also join. Um, it's all about celebrating the joy of making. And that's what's it's at the heart of the guild. And so we'll celebrate all of Sar's work with Boldport. Um, we'll celebrate, yeah, all of the make affairs. We're just enjoying making. And that goes back to the people we want to meet are the people who are enjoying things, the spirally ups. Spirally ups. Well, Lucy, it's been wonderful to talk to you. Do you have any thoughts you'd like to leave us with? If you want to know more, join us on Twitter for Makers Hour, which is every Wednesday evening, 8 p.m. UK time. Look for the hashtag Makers Hour and you will see various makers having a good chat and showing, doing some show and tells, showing what they've made, asking questions and helping each other. I attended last week. It was quite amusing. I do recommend it. <laughs> Our guest has been Dr. Lucy Rogers, Maker-in-Chief at Guild of Makers. I feel like there are a lot more titles I'm leaving out there, but that's the one she wanted. You can find Guild of Makers at www.guildofmakers.org. Thank you for being with us, Lucy. Not a problem. It's been great fun. Thank you to Christopher for producing and co-hosting. Patreon supporters, thank you for helping me to send mics to guests. And of course, to all of you listening, thank you for listening mm. you can contact us <laughs> at show at embedded.fm or hit the contact link on embedded.fm where you can agree or disagree with christopher's humming and now a quote to leave you with from julia child 
find something you're passionate about, and keep tremendously interested in it. Embedded is an independently produced radio show that focuses on the many aspects of engineering. It is a production of Logical Elegance, an embedded software consulting company in California. If there are advertisements in the show, we did not put them there and do not receive money from them. At this time, our sponsors are Logical Elegance and listeners like you.